Good Morning Mayberry is brought to you by Amass Studio, LLC. producers and consumers of music and entertainment everywhere started going on high alert to the emergence of a confusing but intriguing movement calling itself Eat Predators. While the name sure is trendy and memorable, and a lot of people have gotten excited about the idea of what a concept like Eat Predators could be, no one really seems to share the same idea of what it actually is. Eat Predators has been marketed as many things, a podcast, an organization, a survivor-led movement, an advocacy and outreach program that simultaneously offers litigation, political and economic pressure, and like-minded community, a one-stop shop for proactive tools to push for rapid and radical change, eliminating abuse that so often transforms working in the music and entertainment industries into a dangerous and taboo hellscape. Eat Predators is an interesting, brassy, predictably unpredictable solution for survivors of abuse all over the world. However, misleading headlines and articles improperly labeling one person, a charismatic and ironically insecure former Nickelodeon child star named Alexa Nicholas as the quote-unquote leader and quote-unquote founder, have warped the impact of this movement and put survivors in danger yet again by preying on their vulnerabilities, specifically by preying on their pain points and their hope. Unfortunately, this harmful mythology about the origins, mission, vision, and values of Eat Predators has spread like wildfire amongst people who are passionate about ending abuse. In this special episode of Good Morning Mayberry, I'm joined by two co-founders of Eat Predators, Kay Brown and Kaylee Higgins. We came together to share our experiences working with Eat Predators and hopefully demystify illusions and shine a light of truth on the optimistic but ultimately delusional and damaging misconceptions. This is the real and true story of how Alexa Nicholas and her husband seized control from the collective of founders that started Eat Predators and turned it into a potent, unstable cult of personality. This episode was recorded on December 13th, 2022. Please welcome my guests, Kay Brown and Kaylee Higgins. This is the real and true origin story of Eat Predators. We're doing great. Just lovely. Cool. Actually, I should move my mic if my laugh is clipping. Okay, we do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, we got it. All right. Yo. Here we are. Hey. Hi. Here we are. <laughs> Hi. How do we start this? Hi. Yo. Do you, do you want to give kind of a intro background? Um, I feel like we should just like launch into the story, kind of like I feel like you two should start because you were there first, and then I showed up just as you were leaving, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, days. I guess Kay never really formally left, but you had distanced yourself for. Yeah. Very oh wow! Yes. Yeah, and then um, at that po- at this point, it seems like you're pretty formally out since you're blocked. Yeah. I guess I'm blocked. It's official now. <laughs> Yesterday, yeah, of, you know, it's just like, year. and it's also tricky. Like, I mean, working in this space is also tricky. Like navigating leaving because like there are a group of vulnerable people that like you leave behind, mm-hmm. and like it's there's like a even personally like if i'm like okay like whatever like it's still like important that like we ethically like make sure that people have resources and like nowhere to go and like all of that and so like that's 
part of the part of the navigation of kind of the way that stuff happens but um but yeah i guess we can kind of start uh just knowing that yeah. um, that's what I'm the most worried about yeah, i think that's like my biggest impetus to do this is just to hopefully reach those people who might still be vulnerable and you know just to try and at least let everybody know and make sure everyone's informed to the best of our ability um you know, so hopefully we can prevent this from happening again. Definitely. Yeah. Ideally. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I hope that there's some time and room to recover. I don't feel like this is quite the end of the story. We're just kind of documenting what's happened so far and also, like, in doing so, changing the potential for the future because uh, I think, like, that we're supposed to just shut up and go away, I think. We're supposed to just maybe disappear and feel overwhelmed at the odds and the stakes and how many people are involved. And, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm supposed to feel intimidated, but I don't. So, um, and I do feel like I need to be talking about this. I haven't had a moment where I'm like, oh, the, the terrible things that are being done, uh, they're so terrible I don't want to talk about them i don't you know that can happen uh so yeah i guess Absolutely. um how did you two get involved with the predators uh um before we well, start can yeah. can you see on your side that the audio on my end is picking up properly yes so i'm looking at a, a flat it is i see your sound wave oh yes. same with me my lips. I see both okay, so I guess, okay, I can, I can see yours, so, yeah, that's fine. Okay, I can see both of yours, I just wanted to make sure, because it looked flat on my end, so I just wanted to make sure. No worries. I'm going to um, close my door for you, so there's no, like, sounds that come in. I did, This just made me remember that right, that's right. a thing. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, so, um, we, this whole thing started, um, so due to the confidential nature of the work that I do, there are going to just be some things I have to kind of skirt around just to maintain, like, confidentiality for different people involved. Um, so, like, if we might hit something, I'd be like, I can't confirm or deny type of thing. Um, but what, what I can say um, in terms of all of that is that this whole thing started um, really about um, this whole, like, kind of movement started realistically because of, like, Diplo. And so, like, with that, there was a protest where he was basically playing, like, an all-ages type show. Um, it was an eat-the-rich type, uh, type, like, protest or whatever. And so there were supposed to be, like, ice cream bars. Um, it was a col collab with Mischief, um, which they do, like, all of that kind of uh, stuff. And so well, with that, there was... it, I, it wasn't we, we protested there. It wasn't supposed yeah. to be a protest. It, well, the, you're right that they did have an eat the rich sign, which I guess is supposed to be a protest sign. But it was like a weird it was so jarring to see him performing in front of this eat the rich sign at an ice cream DJ event. You know, It had nothing to do with that. Yeah. And also he's just he's one of the richest DJs in the country. So was ironic. It, yeah. Was so it like just that ironic combined art? with like also or being weird he, also it was that, like part of their the whole show, right? Like or part of their branding or something. Okay. For yeah. the, it, I think it was an ice cream company sponsoring this show. It was um like on the street. So he was playing in front of their ice cream truck just on the street in Hollywood. And uh yeah, the this was the first protest that Eat Predators did, and um, the name Eat Predators came from the fact that he was playing in front of that Eat the Rich sign, so it was like a play on that saying Eat Predators instead of Eat the Rich. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I can get and down with the ironic so use of Eat the Rich because media <laughs> is consumable, and like it's like food for our brains, so I could see him feeling like taking that back from that kind of angle uh, or something. But yeah. Um, yeah, so there was a. When you consider Go ahead. the whole like length of just like when you consider the whole length of like all of these like media outlets talking about like the harm that he has like 
caused for like over a decade. I mean, like we're not talking like small outlets, like there's literal stuff that he's admitted to in billboard. Um, like you're looking at more than a decade of abuse that like there's stuff that's out there. There are people who have commented, there are people who have been involved that have publicly commented. Um, but just to like see him show up and like, I don't know, you know, like we, there's, especially in when you're talking about like sexual violence or like whatever, like you keep trying to like, or people normalize that it's like a man in the bushes or like, you know, like some stranger danger or whatever, but to like see somebody like that with that long standing history of like discussion of them harming other people and like even some things that he has publicly said that he has done, um, seeing that show up at like an ice cream truck just like felt very, I don't know, alarming to yeah. say the least. I, well, yeah. I, I well, saw and, his tweets, and that's, like, I mean, I know other things. I've read the articles and all of it, but his tweets alone, I'm like, that's enough for me. I don't need to have longer conversations with anybody mm-hmm. about him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But Eat Predators, so we, the people who were at that protest, we were all already connected because we've all been advocates specifically around ending sexual assault and rape culture in music in the music industry and nightlife industry and um so alexa and i had become connected because she had done a post about how red light management was helping enable her abuser and they had done the same thing with mine i put her in touch with my lawyers they ended up working with her um we i i had connected with Kay also around this time that i uh, called out my abuser um, cause Kay has a nonprofit called Four for Consent that does specifically advo- advocacy and education harm reduction for nightlife music industry and is really focused on the EDM world in particular. So Kay's really knowledgeable about my abuser and, um, the specific scene that he was a part of. Uh, so they had been really helpful, supportive uh, for through that whole time. So when Eat Predators formed because one of the lawyers who was part of this larger task force that we've all been a part of, which is a group of advocates and lawyers and um, all different kinds of people who are have the same mission to end rape culture in the music industry. Uh, we've all been kind of loosely connected and meeting and working together, helping each other um, for a couple of years. So one of the lawyers had gotten us together and suggested that we all organize um, the survivors who were already active on our own using our social media to speak out and um we so we already had this idea to organize and then a couple days later we find out that diplo is doing this show and then it was alexa's idea to go protest at that show as the first um you know kind of action that we would do together yeah yeah and from there um we ended up having a like a more like a we had like a a brunch or whatever and we all like met and there um then that was a like for me that was the first time I um I met Socho and just kind of like talked organized that type of stuff and then from there um we decided to kind of like take continued action trying to like raise awareness on some of the issues that were happening happening in the industry um, there are a decent amount of cases that um, that are just being like brought forward, especially with like the same groups of people. Um, so like there was a lot of discussion about like different things that like Red Light has that you know they've been a part of different lawsuits and um, just different stuff from there. And you know after we had brunch, we ended up going over to um, over to Alexa's and just working on different like basically like supportive like. Uh, signs and like that type of stuff and like kind of messaging as well um, surrounding like the next steps of like moving forward. Yeah. And then we decided we would continue to protest once a week. Um, And so for, I think it was the first three or four protests, we continued to get together at Alexis and do that same kind of process of researching, um, figuring out what the signs were going to be, you know, what we were going to say, the chants and everything, like what we were there specifically to protest. And we decided we would go to the music industry institutions like Warner and Sony, Live Nation, Red Light, um, the big music industry 
corporate giants that uh, enable and perpetuate systematic culture of abuse. And um, yeah, so that's how it started. You know, the first three or four times it was K and I social. Um, there's a few other people, you know, kind of all that were there uh, at least at the first. I think it was just four of us, maybe like at the first few, and then, uh, you know, it, did, it started to grow after like three or four. But um, yeah, in the beginning, we were all getting together and very collectively making decisions about where we would go and what we would talk about, um, what we would put on the signs and so forth. And, uh, but then things changed. I left. Um, I, I went to New York for a month and to in my perspective, that's when things really started to change. Uh, I mean, I guess I don't. I just felt I was no longer part of the decision-making process. Like Alexa wasn't asking me for input anymore on where the next protest would be or what they would be protesting or anything. And um, yeah, so that it was it was a slow kind of change. But I think that's after about the third or fourth protest is when um, things started to shift. Yeah. And like in, you know, like starting and stuff, there was a lot of, um, you know, like I have almost a decade working in this field and we have other people in, on our team who have worked in music for a long time. And like it at some point shifted from like coming to us and being like, hey, how would you handle this? Like whether it was like, how would you handle this messaging or like what is something important that's publicly available that we can know to like talk about? um to like how to you know different just different suggestions and stuff and like really trying to like address the the issues um and then with those like contributions like we we wanted to make sure that like people had access to like resources on the back end because it's like you know i'm a nationally credentialed advocate and like i have a code of ethics i have to like abide by and like that's an important part of like the work that we do and like from the really early on, um, I had just like voiced that like, hey, like we need to make sure that like it's not just, um, you know, it's not just like, okay, like there's nowhere to go. And like in the beginning, like Kaylee was handling all of the DMs. So like when somebody would reach out and say like, hey, X, Y, Z happened to me or whatever, that type of stuff, like there would be somebody that was like showing up and who has, you know, handled some disclosures in the back. Um, as well as, like, somebody that could, like, get people directly to resources. And um, I think that that's, like, a really important piece because, you know, I've done in my in my past, like, working, you know, I've done hotline, I've done hospital calls, I've done, like, a whole ton of stuff. But the, the first person that you tell is so impactful for a survivor and how somebody responds to that person can literally change the entire trajectory of somebody's life. And so it was super, super important that, like, somebody was responding who, one, was able to, you know, like, handle that type of information and, like, create that space, but also, like, be able to do so in a place that, like, this person had, like, a soft place to land. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's step back for – well, me. go ahead. I was just no. going to say that was the most important part of it to me is uh, – uh, that's really what I thought it was – all about building those connections, you know, building a hub essentially like in person at the protests and with social media um, to like the main chant that we did at all the protests, Survivors United and Survivors United will never be divided. Like, but like we were summoning survivors to reach out to us and tell us their stories and join this community. So uh, to, I just thought this was something that was we didn't even have to say because it was just like obvious. I thought we were just all on the same page that um, this was kind of priority number one to actually build community with the people, the survivors who are reaching out, really try to be a bridge for as many of them as possible to get them resources. We have this whole task force of the lawyers and advocates and everyone that we can plug them into. So that that's what the whole that's why I was so excited about this idea of us organizing together because there was the potential to help so many people directly like that through that kind of direct mutual aid. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big moments where, when I realized that Alexa's whole approach or vision was just not aligned with mine or was when I, she told me, I told her, you know, that, that this has become kind of a full-time job. Just we're getting so many DMs and emails and, 
she said, well, we're not a survivor hotline, so just don't respond to any of them anymore. And that it, you know, to me, it was just so jarring and confusing. Like, well, if we're not going to do that, then what are we even doing? Mm-hmm. What's the point of <laughs> all this? Uh, you know, I mean, yes. Yeah. The things was oh, that. Oh. That was um, probably, so that would have been just like three weeks before I really, like everything blew up and I left. And then uh, that was a few days before you came in Uh, Mm -hmm. or, but I guess, so I had put like almost five months. Yeah, that was like about five months in, Um, but I, uh, I, that it was so shocking to me that she also, that it was like news to her that. Um, we were, you know, that this was a big job to handle all these DMs and emails and stuff that, like, she seemed surprised that I was even, uh, you know, trying to respond to everybody. And uh, that, uh, yeah, it just really showed me how that we were on very different pages um, with our approach and intentions. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the this primary amount of these correspondences were coming through the DM on the social media on Instagram. So let's talk about where that Instagram originated and what happened with that. Oh, yeah. Well, so that was a page um, that I had used for a different kind of social justice project before that had wrapped up. Like I was just not using it anymore, but I had already, I had put in like over a year of building that page to almost a thousand followers. And, um, that yeah she i i said we could repurpose it for e predators but it was also this is when in the beginning we were talking about how we all had our wheelhouses like that it, this that this collective works so well because i had the experience of in social media management and marketing and kay had the nonprofit the national credentials you know the actual training with harm reduction and um the knowledge and education about this stuff and then alexa we were talking about her as like the spokesperson and kind of ambassador like she was really great with the public facing doing the press stuff and then neela um, was doing the systems management. Like she was really great with m- managing the back end of the Patreon, the Discord, the, all the kind of online infrastructure that we had built. And um, so when I offered to repurpose this page into Predators, it was under the impression that like I was gonna be managing it, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. we th- th- that this was like my my contribution or you know like the thing that I would be in control or that in charge of. Um, and uh, yeah, when we had a falling out before, I mean, literally like within minutes after we just kind of, uh, I hung up on her. We had barely even talked about anything. Um, she changed the password and locked me out of that page and locked me out of the emails and the Discord and everything else. And um, yeah, I mean, it happened so fast. It was like we literally had not even had a conversation yet about uh we like we had just started uh, you know she based, uh, so to back it up she had i had told her that i was this had become a full-time job and i we just needed to make it make sense for everybody you know that it did she was the only one getting tangible benefits um with the press and this is that how this is something that she could put on her resume because all the articles say that it's hers she's the founder organizer but they don't credit anybody else and um that you know, we it at least needs to feel like this is going to be sustainable eventually, that eventually we will get paid back for what we're all investing. And um, I so uh, she, I guess, was really offended by how I talked about it or just the, some things that I said. I it was she told me I made her cry. I, I thought I was just being really matter of fact and direct about it. But I guess she, apparently to her, it was like a huge surprise that I was feeling this way. And it wasn't just me you know but uh i and that to me like i was saying was surprising in itself that she i was like you know to me it was like how do you think all this stuff has been happening like do you think it's just been magically getting done we had patreon discord email social media um the protests every week like there was so much to manage and um i guess i just assumed that she was aware of how much work we were all having to put into it to keep all that afloat Mm -hmm. and it was like total it just seemed like total news to her she was she was really shocked and um felt, you know really upset by me try, having this con- trying to have this conversation essentially saying that uh we need to get paid or figure out a way where we can um 
you know, not like we want to get rich off this thing, but we, this, we can't be doing unpaid labor for what has become a hierarchy. It went from being a collective, just organic group of people coming together, making decisions together, to now a very clear hierarchy where every article says you are the founder and leader and you know, you're no longer asking for our input on where the next protest is going to be or what, what's going to be on the signs or you know, any of the key decisions that we were all making together before. So clearly things have changed. This is a hierarchy now. We're essentially doing unpaid labor for a boss and we need to have a real, you know, just like get realistic about what's happening and um, figure out how to make this make sense for everyone. And uh, yeah, so she, that conversation, I, I, so I felt like I made it really clear in that conversation, the things that are really stressing me out are feeling like I have a boss, which this is not what I signed up for. I thought I was signing up to be part of a collective and um, I, and also just suddenly having way too much on my plate because also she was doing things like making huge decisions, for example, announcing the book club without even not only not getting our input, she didn't even give us a heads up. And at that point, our, the emails, the DMs, everything was already so overwhelming. Neela and I were both really stressed managing it. And then all of a sudden she announces this book club and it, it explodes like 10 times more. And you, there's so many decisions she made like that, like with the Discord where we thought in the beginning, we put a lot of work into the Patreon. The Discord was originally, we thought all of us had agreed on this being something that it was um, like you could, be part of the Discord if you signed up for the first tier of the Patreon. Mm -hmm. And then she started giving that Discord link out to, I guess, 80 plus people eventually without yeah. telling us I, them or saying anything. But what that meant is that we were then put in, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, what it meant is that we were put in a position where we were expected to moderate the di the Discord, uh, suddenly this group of like 80 plus people and the book club. And, uh, one of the things too that happened that kind of lead, built up to this conflict was, um, I when she announced the book club, I told her, you know, how I was feeling, how Neil and I both were feeling. Like this is, uh, I wish you had told us. I mean, this is not we a good time. Neither one of us would have wanted to sign up to do this right now. We're already like at our max, and um, she was just like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll I'll handle everything. And then a month later, when the first book club meeting happened, she told me that she was actually really upset with us because we hadn't joined the book club and weren't there to help her moderate it. And so you know, it was like she had reached out even to me about showing up and like not even I mean, I've ran groups like with survivors and like have experience, have professional training and all of that. And like she tried to make it seem as if I was just going to show up and be a participant when that's like not what she wanted either. She wanted somebody with professional moderation experience and I mean, there were various conversations throughout the time where I was like, you know, are is this going to be something that's funded or not? If it's not going to be funded, like, I have to go to my funders and I have to say, we have to pay staff for this. I need X, Y, Z money. And it's totally fine if, like, somebody doesn't have the capacity to, like, pay, but then it's my job as the boss of an agency to make sure that my staff are taken care of and that, like, professional ethics are met, professional support is met all of that stuff but like that wasn't the informed consent that like anybody got about like the whole process of like book club right so here's yeah. where i'm gonna cut in for a sec because that's where i showed up i saw a random post about book club i think it was the, maybe the second one because they had read a chapter i don't know if i'm not sure exactly when the first one went up i was there it was like september uh maybe 24th or something like that. I'd have to check to be sure, but uh, I'll put some kind of edit in if I'm wrong. But it was uh, definitely not a well-facilitated group, but it was a lot of fun and very cute. And there was conversation about the book that was being read. It was called How to Be Eaten, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, it was very meta. Um, but... Um, yeah, it was a really bizarre group. And my first impression with Alexa, she was just so sweet. And it was like all introductions, like everybody was given all this time to talk about themselves. Uh, and then they talked about this book, and it was very bizarre. And she led a meditation at the end that was like the most well-performed meditation that I've uh, participated in, um, group meditation, which was 
interesting to learn more about her history with uh, yoga and meditation groups. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty much it. And then the, the next few meetings, it became really evident to me that she was struggling to manage the schedule with everybody and didn't quite seem to have uh, it, it. There were enough issues in a short enough period of time that I started to worry about people's lives and mental health because she was switching things up enough after, you know, we've been planning things for two weeks and then at the last minute it would be, can we move it to a different day in a couple of days? And then when some people couldn't make it, but others could, she didn't really care who could make it or who couldn't, uh, or who confirmed or who didn't. It, it just seemed to revolve around her, uh, having people to hang out with when she wanted to. Um, so I, I kind of thought that that wasn't intentional uh, and maybe wasn't a super big deal at first, but it managed to, like, escalate, I guess, uh, and spread into all kinds of other things. She was committing to other people in front of me. Um, and then the book clubs kind of ended up becoming, um, we were very aware that they weren't support groups, but almost everybody in them was under 30, uh, a lot of them under 25, and had... Uh, it drew in a demographic of people that had trauma stories in uh, some pretty niche ways, and there was a lot of sharing that happened there. And um, yeah, I it's hard for me to think about now because uh, retrospectively, it's been weaponized against everyone who shared in that space so much. But at the time, it was uh, like it had a lot of potential is what it, what I think if it would have been done better differently yeah like, uh but like you know an explosive it. engine you know like it could have been a vehicle but it's expl it's very harmful what's ended up happening with it all the different ways it could have driven as a vehicle certainly a lot to think about um but yeah uh the after me I think it was the second book club alexa put her phone number in the chat and asked everybody to put all of our phone numbers in the chat and i was like this is forward interesting uh and then i think that was the same meeting that she invited us all into the discord and neela was the only admin at that point uh and i was one of a few people that dropped in on neela's dms thinking neela was like busy or something uh and really it was overwhelm um more than that this shouldn't have been happening that all of us are showing up and wanting to change things and do a bunch of stuff but the request was that two of the new people coming in through the book club be made into moderators so that basically this overwhelmingly uh outnumbering group of random people could then uh, sort of feel a sense of community and authority uh, a bit. It was a weird group yeah. to be a part of. Um, I think that's all I have to say about it for right now. Uh, yeah, but I think you brought up something that's like really important. Like one of the critiques that I had like towards the beginning, like we're talking about like what July and August was that I kept being asked for stuff and, like, um, would carve out stuff, like, time and space in my schedule and would make sure that stuff was, like, getting addressed, whether it's, like, make sure, like, some research was done or material, like, was ready for, like, whatever was needed. Or, like, she said at that point had started to get, I think, the first wave of interviews, which, like, um, I had nothing to do with, like, the scheduling of the interviews or anything like that, but... Um, you know, the, like, the collective had done enough work that, like, some of that stuff started to, like, land, and so, like, with that, she had asked me to prep for, like, different interviews that she was going to be upcoming doing, and then to create time and space in my calendar to be able to provide, like, an advocacy, like, lens on whatever, as well as, like, follow up with, like, different journalists and all of that type of stuff to try to help, like, ensure that one, like, there was going to be the pieces of credibility and the professional, like, support that like needs to be illustrated in the media because a lot of the outlets like don't tell I don't want to say don't tell the full story but like they don't 
conceptualize like the importance of like what happens and that like, it really misses the boat and once you have somebody in an article like that and they're interested about like whatever that is it's one of the most in my opinion like one of the most impactful places that you can have some sort of like education or even a support resource to like send somebody to um because they're already walking down that path like you have the ability to you know build that bridge or like put a hand out like to them to try to like help them um, in some way, shape, or form, and then, you know, I would do whatever I was supposed to do to, like, be be prepped, be ready, and then um, it was just always, like, shoved off, like, oh, like, oh, yeah, like, it's coming, or oh, yeah, like, it's, you know, in in coming up, or whatever, and, like, for me, like, it's not, it's not about, like, all of that, like, I, it's about like making sure that like stuff is done in a sense of like ethically where we're really like taking care of the community because like it's not like survivors already go through so much that like to go ahead and like trigger them and to not give them somewhere to go with that and to not give them some sort of like validation or like help or like support or even knowing you know like some of the stuff that was like published, I mean, like there's not even like the national sexual assault hotline at the bottom of, a, of an article. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, you know, if you're feeling upset, here's somebody to talk to or like, here's where to go or da 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 da. Like it, I mean, to me, like working in this and working with people for such a long time, is just like, it feels like to me professionally, it feels like borderline neg- negligence. To, like, well, agree let me, to, like, upset somebody and, like, know that it's going to upset somebody. And then not only that, but just to, like, kind of, like, erase everything. Like, it wasn't, like, this was all just, like, one person. And, like, that's not, that's not true. I'll like, say. it's not true at all. I don't think it's borderline negligence. I think it's full-blown negligence. From what I understand with your input, at every possible turn your professional expertise has been demeaned and undermined uh maybe not every possible turn anywhere it can be kind of co-opted for opportunistic um like tokenizing use like she doesn't even get the full use out of it because she just does what she wants with what she perceives the opportunities to be but um let's talk for a sec about the nickelodeon protest because that's really where my attention got locked in on e predators i've been uh, working for a while on predatory industrial stuff, like just generally that's been my one of my niches for a while, um, but particularly with my podcast, it's kind of refined more and more uh, into that, and my track into it started, somebody kicked me off into Amanda Bynes' conservatorship after I'd been the only person yelling about Britney's conservatorship in my social scene for a long time. Uh, And so, like, Alexa, for me, uh, she's sort of like a fragment in what I've already been concerned about and working on and looking for ways to work with. so yeah, eat predators as a concept. I, I talk a lot about superstructures and um, cancel culture being strategic about m- making sure that people are aware, uh, you know, kind of like like anti-marketing, counter-marketing about people that are trying to launder their reputations to make money. Uh, also putting their like it's it's more alarming to me when people are trying to be predators and make money putting their art into people's heads, especially when it's art that's like comfort food and people get really into it through trances, dancing, or uh, receiving narrative um, are like two of the primary ones that bother me a lot. So uh, yeah, Alexa's Definitely. story um, and Eat Predators movements at the time when the book club came out, I was brought into it by uh, someone else who was on leadership at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, that it just, it was speaking my language already, like what I'd already been doing. Um, so the Nickelodeon protest was particularly interesting to see this meta moment of full circle um, 
I don't know, I'm not sure what to call it now. I know what I thought it was at the time. <laughs> it was hypnotic. I mean, that's the way it was designed. I mean, like, that's, right. I mean, so if you think about, like, the protests, um, Nickelodeon was, I guess, technically, technically the third time that, like, the people who had caused harm had um, impacted her in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, like, with that, the the first being Brian Friedman. Um, when Brian Friedman tried to, uh, how can I say this? Basically, Brian Friedman had escalated in some way, shape, or form, um, not, like, trying to cause, like, physical violence or anything like that. But um, with that, that was the first time, and we had identified, like, really early on, this was the first time, you know, we went to his office protested outside but that was the first time in the conversation that I had with her is like they just put a face to this you are now a face of somebody that's impacted and that was a conversation that we had at her house uh-huh. um and Brian Friedman is Diplo's lawyer just for yes. anyone that doesn't know <laughs> Brian Friedman yeah. is almost so, every from oh, what I can tell almost me. everyone terrible's lawyer <laughs> In the entire yeah, world of yeah. entertainment, he, I can't find a single Brian awful Freeman's, person that he's not their lawyer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah Brian Brian Freeman Freeman Alexis Alexis did hit back, definitely, um, with people who are accused of sexual violence um, quite often. Uh, he does represent some survivors. Uh, we believe that he doesn't give them full disclosure. Um, that was kind of like from the from the beginning, we were like, do people who have been harmed that you are representing do they know like they, that they not might only no now that Rolling Stone made people, an article about him also yeah but also like back we're talking like over the summer like June and July do they also know that you had to make a good faith settlement because you were accused of you know you were accused of sexual violence you were accused of gang rape of a minor is what he was accused of and he had to make a good faith settlement on that. And do your clients know that? So that was the first time. The second time being red light, and there, you know, it wasn't just her that was impacted by red light. And then you roll around to um, early in August. You know, everyone was talking about Jeanette McCready and her book, all of that stuff. Um, I had a meeting with Alexa. I wasn't originally aware that the entire thing was going to be like one-on-one or whatever, but I went over there. We had a conversation about some concerns that I had and that people had brought to myself as well as our organization related to her Um, and can't really share a lot. But basically the theme was that some way, shape or form, like this person was concerned that somehow this movement was going to be made about Alexa rather than survivors is one, one of the issues um, amongst others. And so with that, eventually, um, you know, that all was resolved in some way, shape or form, you know, discussions, da, 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 da. And then like kind of moving forward after that, um, she had asked me about whether or not, because like we were very focused on music, we were very focused on the music industry and that's it the entire scope of what we were doing. Um, The music industry and like attorneys who represent people in music, like that's all connected. And so then the conversation moved to, do you think that we should protest at Nickelodeon? And I had said, well, like, I think so, because it's like music, entertainment, all of that. Some of the people coming out of there also have like careers in music Mm -hmm. as well as like, okay, you were there, like in addition, and then had a conversation and before I had left the house that day, I had pitched the concept of like D-Slime, D-Slime Nickelodeon mm. was what I had pitched. And her and her husband were like, oh, that's like brilliant, da 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 We were laughing. We were having a good time with it um, because, you know, like brainstorming, like all all ideas are good in brainstorming. Mm-hmm. And then it was it was set that, you know, she talked to everybody else. And then we're like, OK, like that's that's what's going to happen. Like Nickelodeon is happen- happening happening. Mm. All right. And Nickelodeon is when things really blew up with the press. That's when we got right. for the first time um like headline news and all that stuff and there there uh, things had been shifting but I think there was a very clear like a big change after that happened where mm-hmm. um Alexa started getting just tons of interviews and podcasts and 
all that. And it just for a while felt like, oh, well, she's so busy, like doing interviews and podcasts every day. And that I kind of just kept chalking up her not being present or the issues I was having with her to that. But, you know, eventually, um, like I said, got to the point where it's like, well, she is the one um, who's just started making all these decisions. We never collectively agreed uh like after we did you know the nickelodeon protest is something that uh, we had like the, that idea had kind of floated for a while just was kind of obvious because of dan schneider or, um yeah dan schneider and Jen, jeanette mccurdy's book coming out the fact that everyone was talking about him and that that was a perfect mm-hmm. storm of timing kind of thing mm-hmm. like that i think that just seemed really obvious to all of us but then uh after nickelodeon i think it felt like she, even more so she just started to make all the key decisions and right. um, had no, like started to make changes to things like, for example, giving themes to the protests, having people dress up and um, you know, just all of these decisions were made without anybody's uh, input. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, it was just, but it was weird. It was, there was a big cognitive dissonance going on because Like, for example, when I brought this all up to her um, and I said, this has clearly shifted to a hierarchy and and I was really trying to give her as much compassion and great. Like I I was like, I know I don't I don't believe that this was ever your intention. Like I'm not blaming this on you at all. I am really blaming the media more than anything that like they now that the media has written presented it like this, like you are the founder, leader, the face of everything. I could see how now. You have you probably feel a lot more pressure that anything that goes out is going to have your name on it essentially. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm, I, I was like, that's fine. You know, like we can adapt to this new kind of structure of it, uh, but we just have to be open and honest, realistic about what's happening here, and make this make sense um, for everyone. And so that, uh, but when I told her that it had clearly shifted to a hierarchy, she was like, "What do you?" what do you mean? It is a collective. Like she kept insisting that it was a collective, but it wasn't operating like a collective anymore. And I, that I still am just so confused on how she, where the the disconnect there, you know, like she just kept insisting. Uh, And I think, I feel like probably still to this day, really, like if somebody asked her would say that it's a collective, a survivor led collective, it's like, you're the only survivor leading this collective. (laughs) It's not a collective yeah. if it's one person leading it. So well, I'll say one of my one of my problems once I got uh, neck deep in things because I ultimately ended up without taking up a bunch of time for narrative. Ended up going down to LA and uh, trying to fill in the gaps where y'all had left space, not knowing that you ever existed at all or what you were doing from my <laughs> perception it was this magical thing that sort of happened when she as this little nickelodeon star ran out into the streets with some people didn't know who and with their well-made signs and cute little outfits got a bunch of media attention and now all of a sudden a collective needed to be formed to feel the movement that was coming it was such a warped message that i got um, through perceiving Certainly. things from Northern California. I'm just up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, putzing around with my little podcast, so excited about the idea of uh, Eat Predators is a little aggressive and, um, like, hot topic or something <laughs> like that, you know, but I can get down with it for purposes, and it fits alongside my vibe in the ecosystem of businesses or concepts or groups or whatever, clubs. Any sort of, however it's structured, I was like, that belongs in my world. Uh, It's part of my current and future perceptions of, like, how we're going to get this shit fixed, whatever that means. It was so romantic and fanciful. Um, So, uh, yeah, I brought myself down to L.A., and the intention was because there were a lot of moving parts. One of the things, she had us doing work this book club group um, a a little bit, not very much, but we wrote a protest about getting Diplo uh, pulled out of June shine basically. And uh, I did not know when we wrote this uh, petition um, that uh, there was already one that was written um, before by 
someone else. I cannot confirm nor deny if I know someone that may or may not. I, um, I, I mean, but, you know. Yeah. That's, I that's was reaching out to a petition. <laughs> it I was can... definitely a Diplo petition that existed yeah. in 2021. It's got quite the narrative. Yeah. Uh, lots of publicly available information. So yeah. like, as an advocate, I love to see publicly available information. Anybody listening, seriously, uh, if you're writing something, if you cite stuff back, publicly available information, guess what? It's publicly available. Love that. Yeah. And well, and the point is that it's it, it's something where um, this weed. No, I definitely I know the person who started that petition. I know Alexa is knows who that person is or knows that we all know each other. It, we could have very easily just updated that petition instead of making a whole new one. Um, but this is an example of like if this had actually been a collective, two heads are better than one kind of thing, and we had been able to come together and share our input. Um, you know, maybe someone could have suggested that, but it's like she just kept making these decisions without anybody yes. else's suggestions or opinions or anything. What I can comment on is that the person who, the person who wrote it was reached out to oh. and that there was like a lack of accountability in terms of they had asked about certain kind of like boundaries and certain kind of like, what does this look like moving forward in that capacity? Huh. And, um, like you know how do we do this and that and then there were some promises that were made to said person and they're just like never fall like fall back on mm -hmm. they were said they were told that there would be someone to take care of like compensation to and like uh -huh. to go ahead and uh do that moving forward and then that like, just like never it never happened and then i know that like the person was then like seriously like asked like on multiple occasions basically to turn over their formula writing and like people who do that work who like put together things like that, like that there's a, there's a very intentional skill set that goes into writing stuff like that and mm -hmm. being able to like meet somebody where they're at to educate them. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I don't feel that it's like ethical to like just expect somebody to, who does that, you know, a writer who does stuff like that to just go ahead and like hand that over and be like, this is my formula. This is how I do it. Like, especially when like they're, pretty good at it um and they've had other like past successes and like they're very familiar with like who put it together as well as like their portfolio and like all of that um because they and they thought it was relevant enough um that they had wanted for that person to be a part of it because they sought that out so well, well and i'll that's say also part um, of is important <laughs> yeah having seen well after the fact after everything between me and e-predators and Alexa completely was sabotaged by Alexa uh, unilaterally, in my alleged opinion, um, and like ev evidentially, like, is that the word? Is that a word? Uh, just patently, like I've, I've got nothing, but I keep looking back at things like, where did I do anything that could possibly look like we're in a fight or that I'm doing something wrong or that, because my whole thing was I started, I got down there to, LA and I thought that we were going to do a few meetings about a couple of things. I went down there on, it was, I guess, a fourfold agenda. Uh, one was to get like infrastructure in place so that people weren't communicating in 55,000 different ways because she was like, let's download Signal and have Proton <laughs> and like, let's have like an iMessage and there was like an Android group text and just like all these things. and. Then it started turning into more, yeah. even, even if it wasn't meeting related, we were in the Discord and hanging out, but the, or even if it wasn't workflow related with deliverables, uh, a lot of what we were doing, there were, there were meetings for, we had book clubs, so it was like, let's get things together to sort out your life and everything that's revolving around whatever this movement actually is, if it's an organization, if it's going to be some kind of structure, what is it? Um, so I have some expertise and tools uh, to provide and that kind of thing and I was thinking like oh shit this has just magically happened underneath this poor person like how how do I catch up you know and so I get down there and uh it was it was awesome it was lovely like a lot of the trip was wonderful and I really enjoyed spending time with her I thought I was getting to know someone that uh was turning into a really good friend and uh there were a lot of delays with the work that I actually came down there to do um 
And then additionally, right before I went down there, I had made a joke in the Discord when a conversation about some things with messaging and public communications was going on with everybody in there uh, about not me sliding in as your new PR manager or as Alexa's new PR manager. And then she came in and liked the little comment that I'd made and that ended up opening up a conversation for us to actually decide for me to do that. Um, so right as I was getting down into LA, she forwarded me the uh, final cut, the second to final cut of the Christy Carlson Romano podcast. Um, and I got last sweep on that and had to talk to them about uh, some some vibes, uh, just a couple of things that need to be trimmed off um, for the final cut that ended up coming out. Um, and then from there, we were talking about Those a few... Are like the editing advice, right? Am I right? Sorry. When you say sweeps, you mean like editing advice, like input basically on how stuff is going to be perceived. And yeah, like... there were a couple of points in the conversation that they uh, didn't handle things in the most uh, smooth manner, and it sort of gave... Um, give room for the audience to have some awkward feelings. I'm just pretty good with editing. And so it, it wasn't necessarily like, you know, uh, uh, Alexa was stressed about it, but she couldn't quite figure out why she was stressed. And so bringing me into the conversation ended up uh, clarifying what her anxiety was revolving around. And then it just made more sense okay. for me to take over every step of the way. Um, and so we had a conversation over the next couple of days about solidifying that agreement. And um, it, uh, it turned into, I, the whole trip itself ultimately was, was good, but a lot of things got pushed back, I'll say. There, there was a lot of weird stuff that kind of came up and things that I was sort of seeing as red flags. Um, and there were some things about it that I was like, this is just like truly too good to be true, like that a person could have these things to say or this type of praxis, like where does all of this come from? Um, and just as I was leaving, uh, Alexa and her husband basically let me know that they were planning to take one of my ideas. I'll say it wasn't so much Alexa, but she was on board generally with her husband's idea and one thing I'll say too that's relevant I was concerned for a couple of days because part of the reason that we had delays is because Alexis husband Miko um, interrupted us when we were working on things that I had been talking about with her and she'd asked me to do or I had suggested and she said she wanted done um, and he had some other idea or whatever that he wanted to talk about. So he'd come and interrupt us like, oh, we're in work mode. So let me talk about something work related, but it was distracting and, uh, caused whatever we were working on to not get completely done. Um, there were a, a few times that he stepped in to kind of aggressively put his two cents in on what he thought needed to be happening. Um, some of that was really like pretty dangerous it, he wanted to print some flyers one time and hand them out at like to a crowd of people that are not friendly <laughs> to eat predators at all um and he, it was just going to be to let people know how to find us on the social media account that they apparently stole um allegedly in my opinion um so uh, <laughs> alleged in my alleged opinion that's all right. anyway so um the the takeaway for me, uh, the, the thing that, that Alexa's husband wanted to do basically right as I was walking out the door was to incorporate Eat Predators as an LLC. And that idea, and he was just going to do this, and by the time I came back into town in a couple of weeks, it was just all going to be done. Because um, I was supposed to come back for December. Also, I was, gonna, I was supposed to drive right back to their house after a, a cat sit or whatever. Like I had a date that I had to be up in the North Bay for, and then I was just going to come right back to their house was the plan and figure out where I was actually staying from there, crash there for a night. I actually stayed at their house for five days of my trip down there uh, of the 10 to uh, 15 days that I was down there. So uh, yeah, as I was leaving, um, Miko basically let me know that like they, he, he was 
thinking they would be incorporated as a for-profit before the next two weeks whenever I was planning to come back. And I was kind of like, that's insane. What are you talking about? I what meeting was had where's the collective that's supposed to think about these things together and decide what makes sense for the survivor led movement sir that is not a survivor you're the you're the husband of the celebrity involved in this thing but like from what i understood uh there was leadership there was a collective of leaders but the one who had brought me into eat predators alexa was telling me don't trust this person by the time i got down there and i had no idea what to do with that. Um, and the other leadership that Alexa had described existing, uh, Neela was around, but was the only one left of the actual leadership from what I've discovered since I've really started learning the real story of what happened. Um, but Kaylee, Alexa was actively facilitating an exile and shunning and, and tooling me into doing that. Uh, that was a, another whole part to this that's just kind of like, what, what in the actual hell kind of nonsense Christ awful crap did she think she was pulling? I don't, I really don't know, cause for me, she, she overtly told me, um, lies, but just like bold lies about you. Uh, and at, at first it seemed like she was leading me in a direction where she wanted resolution, and so I offered to, reach out to you and connect with you and because it seemed like you really needed to talk <laughs> and I was like I can listen right like everybody's kind of burnt out on listening and so that's it's just that simple um and as soon as I would get to uh and I also had an incentive to get you to get money flowing so that people were compensated for their work because I obviously knew I was doing work even before I was down there and then as soon as I got down there it wasn't it was eat predators and then it was Alexa as a unique element to it that both are in need of professional management at this point. I talked to both her, her husband, actually I talked to her, her husband, her mom and her best friend. And all of them were like stoked about the idea of there being an opportunity for a reasonable and knowledgeable person to come in and support Alexa specifically. Um, that was also incentivized to get things going with the group. It didn't really feel like anybody was in a position that they wanted to maliciously like steal a movement, you know, but like as opportunities arise, people make decisions and then, you know, the telephone game of ego shit going into the communities of people that do support her. I just can't imagine how she's not getting a lot of, I, I certainly was definitely feeding her nonsense and ego and bullshit while I was down there, not knowing that y'all existed. I, I really thought fucking magic, like just, Looks like magic. Certainly. Certainly. Shucks. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> She's so. What a, what a good bamboozle marketing plan, right? Yeah. It's so ironic to me that, like, just days before you came in thinking all, you know, this must be like some magic, that literally I had just been saying to people, like, when I, you know, I, I was just so confused and shocked by the way that Alexa responded when I tried to have this conversation with her. Um, when I told her, you know, that like we're doing way too much work now, basically for this, it's no longer a volunteer kind of thing. It's like, mm -hmm. um, you know, way, way too much on my, on both of our plates and we need to have a conversation about how this is going to make sense. Uh, that these articles, I, so, uh, one second, these seconds. articles that came out are essentially like at, at least, like 30, 50, maybe a hundred or a couple hundred thousand dollars of free PR and marketing that y'all didn't plan for. So you got the response of like that kind of investment because it just sort of came due to the zeitgeist and interest and it made Rolling Stone and Variety, whoever wrote about it, it made them the money that they needed to make. But y'all were not mm -hmm. asking for that in real time. Uh, sorry, that's... I mean, I don't... Cool. We kind of, so we were, I feel like we were prepared in terms of, like, some of the talking points, because, mm. like, there was stuff that I had advised on, um, and, like, a lot of that is, like, was kind of, like, my role, um, was more of kind of, like, advising, and, like, here is something that, like, cannot be missed, here's a nuance that needs to make, this has to be part of this, 
And so when you hit the right button with somebody and they keep the right button, like at some point it's going to track, uh-huh. like at some point it's going to make it in. And so if it finally like did, but like also like not to the extent of like what all the other things were supposed to be, like those critiques still stand, but it just felt like, like we knew that we were basically playing a slot machine that at some point we knew that people were ready to hear this message. We knew that, you know, legislation changes, like at that point, what was it? California had just ended like arbitration clauses related to like sexual assault and harassment. So we knew like there's going to be press about this. You know, there was stuff getting passed through Congress about like non-disclosure agreements can't be like covering sexual harassment and assault at work. Like that had already started to take traction, so we did. We kept putting money in the machine, uh-huh. waiting and waiting for something to hit, because we knew it, it. Like it's one of the most. I mean, this year has been one of the most, I guess, perfect times um, in terms of like all of that, where like culture, not just culture, has been shifting over the last like couple of years, especially like in music industry in terms of like accountability and like what people really want to see. People have been like more open i would say like from the pandemic to now in terms of like really creating a space for these conversations not just like all you know burn them at the state cancel culture but like okay how do we move forward as a group of people to cr- take these communities back and like create a new future so combining all of that together and then you know legislation started to change in terms of like okay so we know new york just opened their statute of limitations for adult sex crime cases So if you're, like, sexually assaulted, uh, you have the ability to, like, go ahead and seek uh, civil, you know, kind of, like, civil, um, like, a civil case, as well as California, I believe, opens next month. And then you have Arizona and New Jersey. So, like, we knew that all of this was coming. And, like, we also knew, like, we know people who are involved in some of these lawsuits that were being brought forward that, like, we got a heads up, like, so-and-so is going to get sued. Um, You know, like, this is, like, we knew it was going to all happen. But, like, it just was a matter of, like, okay, what is the timeline? Because we have no control over it. We have no control over, okay, like, when is the president going to sign this? Okay, when is the state going to sign this? Mm -hmm. You know, is the governor going to sign this? Or is it going to go back down, you know, in California? Will the governor sign it? Will, you know, the state Senate sign it? We don't know. And then, like, stuff kept moving forward and moving forward, so it just added all of this accelerant. So that this is another example of my, like, fanciful delusion where I was like, you guys weren't even ready. You, you were <laughs> fucking ready. You were professional and you were ready. What you weren't ready for was the scope and nature of Alexa's ego and sensitivity, her fragility, and being able to get called out when things that revolve around her brand impact you as people. She took it personally. Um, She didn't respect you as people or your brands, uh, the expertise that you bring to the table. You fully understood and respected hers. Um, That's such a weird dynamic because the the go-to for people, in my experience now that people are dealing with me, because I've been very vocal. Y'all backed off and kind of went to do your own thing. And I, I, because of how she approach things with me what i'll say to to (laughs) kind of wrap it up uh with with kaylee um like i was definitely weaponized to sort of have an idea about you i don't know that she did that with anyone else i definitely didn't hear about any of this yeah uh i mean and and the first time she really reached out to me to get my help with something she showed up in the discord and she tagged everybody not me and asked if anybody knew where I was and then she dropped into I think the slack that I had suggested that we start that she uh was super gung-ho about at first and tried to get my attention there I noticed at some point that she'd gotten everybody I got a bunch of notifications on discord because people were responding to her because she was in a panic and her panic was revolving around text messages from you uh just talking about <laughs> this stuff like it's con it's conflict and it's charged but it's not like the end of the world it's not a big deal it's just kind of regular conversation when you're in this type of space um and there's so many ways to approach it but she was definitely trying to run from it and find somebody to handle it for her so she'd 
was looking for me. And uh, the way she spun things to me was fallacious. And in my opinion, after getting to know you, defamatory and vile. Um, and I regret listening to her. I wish I'd reached out to you sooner. I think that I could have mitigated a lot of harm if I had been able to see around it. Um, and I don't kick myself too much for it, but it's definitely like a space and things where I'm like, I had choice and like I move towards trusting this kind of endearing, sweet little doe-eyed little <laughs> brat that was looking me right in my eyes and telling me lies about you, you know? Like, um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways that people can go with this type of stuff. Right now what I'm dealing with is I am being shunned by the book club community and the Discord, the moderators that were brought in to take over and – uh, really, like, infiltrate, dominate. Like, I don't think I can call, even though I was one of them, I can't call it anything else now that I've been informed about how the Discord came to be, what it was meant to be for, and I know why we ended up there and how we got there. And while it was a wonderful place and I needed it, um, I'm, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, n it shouldn't have never happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, that community, Alexa, when she, I talked to a couple of people in that group saying that I was concerned about her and, and a little frustrated with her. Um, and I'm fairly certain that a couple of them brought that information back to her, which caused her to immediately drop into the Slack. And I happened to have my phone in my hand, so I saw her put in a message to the group that she was feeling unsafe and needed to felt like she needed to just shut down the slack for a little while and she'd figure it out later and i was kind of like uh oh that's reactionary i have a feeling this might happen immediately so i started going in and taking screenshots of my workflow and the conversations between me and her it was all for like work related stuff and assignments and meetings and stuff plans for the future trying to get ideas sorted in one place so um some people had been assigned research tasks. I was trying to just kind of capture as much as I could, and then all of a sudden it just disappeared in my hands. Um, and then I went over to the Discord and realized that that was gone, uh, and I reached out to one of the moderators who I thought was a friend of mine, Annecy, and Annecy was very worked up and didn't really want to talk for the first time in our couple months of uh, friendship. Um, so... Uh, yeah, later I ended up finding out that a, uh, the other moderator who was in crisis at the time, Alexa, actually reached out to that person and had them remove me and was talking about that she was scared, kind of pulling like vague Carolyn Bryant energy of, uh, you know, we, we don't know what's going on, but we're going to go drag you and we'll ask questions later. Um, and I uh, wasn't having any of that. I don't <laughs> and do you know what it was that triggered her to shut down the slack and like i talk to everyone imagine, about it? I, I, so my concerns revolved around her being inconsistent with people uh not being respectful of people's time it was all the stuff that y'all were already experiencing <laughs> and so she had anxiety i'm sure built up around having no work work ethic and i'll say one person um, I am going to say, Julia, I'm going to say her name, uh, when she was kind of, she had called me at one point when things had gotten tense, because I made some videos on Instagram that got it, the book club all worked up, but why are you being so mean to Alexa, and you're scaring us, you're yelling and crying, and I'm like, you guys are shunning me, it's been overnight now, no one has reached out to me at all, we are friends that talk all the time, Alexa neglects all of us, uh, what gives like y'all don't get to just put me on ice and expect me to just sit there and chill like i'm gonna hop off the ice and start getting mad that you threw me in a weird corner and you're all hanging out in our house we built that place together what are you fucking doing um so eventually people started reaching out to me and they were all pretty much i well three of that four of them reached out to me um and one of them was not having any of Alexa's shit. Uh, two of them were nervous and 
uh, like basically wanted to let me know that they were going to be letting me go as a friend, more or less, and sort of why, but their why was very flimsy and it didn't really hold, um, ultimately, because we talked things out. Uh, and then one of them reached out, say, Annecy reached out saying that they were going to mediate things. Uh, initially, it was going to be a severance of our friendship, but we cleared some stuff up. They had been nervous about one of the things that I said in my in, in my Instagram videos, I had been upset and was not sleeping well and wasn't eating um, right, was in grief, losing multiple people from my life uh, very suddenly in a way that was, it was incredibly unfair to be scapegoated. Hmm? It seems almost also like almost in borderline like crisis, like having a really hard time, like that's a, a whole group of people like to be removed like that quickly, like is especially when you're in such a vulnerable space where they know such like personal details like that's more than reasonable to like have a hard time dealing with that and for it to not have somebody like reach out to like make sure that like you were okay yeah like is yeah yeah it's not acceptable yeah i in retrospect i understand how that couldn't have happened because alexis like she siloed off they're not kids, but they're all young. Um, mm -hmm. And the one that is not young is going through one of the most enormous crises I am familiar with. Um, but the young ones, uh, they all have different reasons for doing what they're doing. I Part of the reason why Alexa, I think, probably was reaching out to you, Kay, and trying to get you to come facilitate stuff is because this. Um, and she just had no idea how to manage a situation in any way. Being in the position where she was able to reach out to these two moderators because both of them are expecting, um, they're expecting interaction and ongoing support from Alexa. She's made promises to them in front of me that I don't, I hope that they are able to find support with one way or another, whether that's through Alexa or otherwise. I don't want to hold my breath um, about Alexa, but um, the uh, the two that she singled out are particularly vulnerable to worrying about losing the power of eat predators. And if they had to pick between the idea of eat predators being Alexa's thing and me saying this stuff, I could see how they would go in that direction impulsively. Um, and over the last couple of weeks, as this has all been shaken out, I was informed pretty much right away, Alexa was telling people not to reach out to me because I was in crisis and none of them are crisis experts. So mm -hmm. she manipulated them into avoiding me when that was not a natural element in our dynamic and was what was putting me in crisis. That was a very interesting, yeah. that, that once we, to each of them that told me that, once we talked about it, they were like, oh, but whatever she was doing to them in the moment, there was no way they were going to be reaching out to me uh, right away. And if I hadn't had y'all step into my life uh, at that time, I don't know... I don't know how that would have been for me. You guys met me at that time and we got to share stories and kind of get things sorted out because it was so messy um, at the pivot point where I came in and y'all were leaving. I guess Kay had just left. Another element, <laughs> too, I think that is, is relevant. I want to address... Um, I don't know how I want to address it, though, because it's such a charged topic. But there's a there's a demographic of people that I feel like Alexa's been mishandling. Um, the Save Our Children, uh, Save the Children, like, kind of vein of the Internet. Um, yeah. Right-wing conservatives are not Alexa's personal political affiliation. Uh, for me, I'm used to that community being a part of my world for a few reasons, but mainly because I've been working in this content and the internet for a while, and so I just know who's also here with me. But um, 
it seems as though she's handled that a couple of weird ways. One of the stories that I was given is that she was giving interviews to uh, a right-wing guy that has a bit of a platform um, for a while, and then I'm not even sure why, but I guess I'm, I'm assuming it's because some people left that maybe she was even concerned about it at all because when I showed up, she was worrying about this person and trying to figure out what to do with him. And my suggestion was to be nice because he belongs in this lane and that's pretty much where we're at right now. Um, I didn't even know at that point that she'd given interviews to this guy, but uh, when I showed up the first protest I went to, Miko, Alexa's husband, was uh, super confrontational with this young dude who has this platform and comes from a uh, more right-leaning community. Um, it's not even more right-leaning. His profile is very obviously right-wing. Um, but his feelings were hurt. He was like, Alexa was like a, a crush of his when he was a kid. He was like a Zoe 101 fan, and he was hurt by the way he was handled. Um, I listened to the conversation, too, and it was just dehumanizing uh, and bizarre. Like, I can't imagine how he could have received that in any way. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to go with that. There were so many moving parts to it when I got there, I guess. Another thing to mention, too, that same protest, she invited all these people that came to the protest back to her house. That was another thing that I was like, I feel like this isn't a good idea but you seem like you know what you're doing and your husband's on board with it. Yep, and really strange because she and I had had a long conversation about why that wasn't a good idea to invite everyone who showed up to the protest back to her house, and she made it sound like she really got it and mm -hmm. understood why that but everyone and the whole movement and just everything at risk and crossed boundaries and just was a bad idea for a lot of reasons. And, but then, uh, after I quit, I ended up doing it anyway, twice apparently, which yeah. it just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, yeah, no, it doesn't make sense to me. And at the time I was a little nervous about it and it, it played out in some ways that I, uh, was alarmed by, um, and for me, as a regular, not exactly total random person, but, like, I, I just would never invite that type of dynamic of relationship back to my home. And I'm not, like, a child star who was a, um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure how to even reverently say this, but she's been tokenized by uh, an incredibly alarming um pedophile foot fetish uh he's like an exhibitionist type like it, i just don't think that it's reasonable to ever bring people into her home unless she I, my whole rule is i gotta know people for like six months before i'm feeling comfortable with them like that really like i, I might make some wiggle room on that for some people but i really don't have people into my home uh for reasons yep so um, yeah. Safety is important, especially in this space of all things. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're doing all of this for your baby. Um. Mm. Or so you say. So <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, yeah. I. I think. Um. We have. We have talked for quite a while about this, and I. I want to come back later and probably address a couple elements of it, specifically in more detail, but. Um, this is like a really lovely overview. I feel so much better after getting this story run together with the two of you. Um, Me too. I do, same. And I do want to also validate, I, I know we'll leave it for later, but um, in terms of like the communication, all of those types of things, like that actually had um, caused a little, I don't want to say like a permanent rift, but it had definitely caused a little bit of like conflict between myself and Kaylee. Mm -hmm. And that was started at the end, to mid, mid to end of August to September. Mm. And both of us opted into the conversation and we leaned in and we navigated that and um, remained accountable mm -hmm. and remained engaging in that um, in community and really 
talked and processed and all of that, but um, I just wanted to validate that like you're not alone and that's a it's a, it's a reoccurring theme. It's a pattern. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you yeah, two but I think were able to reunite. Like, me too. And it it has been really validating in a way just to see like, oh yeah, this we are not alone. I mean it's I it's awful that this is happening to other people too, but that it sadly just kind of inevitable, I think, when when you're a leader of something, you have so much influence over everyone else, you really set the tone for mm. everybody else's experience and your actions ripple out to the whole group. And um I there I think there was just like a lack of experience and I think she did start out with really good intentions and everything, but um, it really takes a lot of maturity and work and like you have to be able to put the good of the group and the cause first ahead of yourself and your own ego. And um, I, I, I don't think she's like this evil person kind of plotting these things. I think it's a lack of, maturity a lack of experience and a lack of understanding really like how to that if she wants to be a leader with great power comes great responsibility and Mm -hmm. um you know that you actually have to really put everyone put yourself in other people's shoes really take on everybody else's uh take responsibility in a way for everybody else's feelings and experience um that you know if, if we were operating as a collective i wouldn't expect that same if, you know, for her to show up at that same level, but if she wants to be the leader, then she has to <laughs> because um, she her decisions and her behavior and affects everybody's lives. Yeah. Yeah. There are consequences. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say I am hoping that we can take all of these events and whatever is coming in the future and help the world become more trauma-informed by being more trauma-informed ourselves, uh, more informed about human dynamics and how to hold space for what's really here and who we're really sharing space with. Um, and, yeah, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but, like, I, Kaylee specifically, like, we've had several conversations about, like, our – continued love and admiration for Alexa and but I would phrase my position as like my hope that she might be able to earn my respect back um as who she really is because I got to meet a person that was made up of the ideas and personalities of like a bunch of other really cool activists and organizers and professionals and people that came to build up what this thing really was she was definitely trying to play the role of the person who built this on her own um so i am hoping that uh this can move i hope that she can move a little bit and i mean i think people have the ability to do better but like they have to want to and part of that is like being honest about like what really happened because like if you're not owning the harm that you caused and you're not or if you're owning it, but only to, like, make it go away. Like, that's not what accountability is. Right. And I think people in positions of privilege, it's like they can more easily just kind of put out fires and then replace wh- whoever it is that they upset with somebody else. You know, it's like they could just kind of put out that fire and move on to the next thing. They don't have to stay and deal with their the the consequences of their behavior as much and um i just wonder if you know this is kind of a result of like a a lack of experience like her not not really learning that lesson yet (laughs) um and that uh you know maybe she thinks that there will people will just kind of continue to replace everybody and so she, she won't have to ever really deal with um all these people that now feel burned but i think that eventually she's going to realize that there's going to be such high turnover like nobody will be able to get close enough and be involved enough long enough to uh without seeing the the dysfunction (laughs) and um it's like if she's going to continue prioritizing loyalty oh you know, it's like she just wants to surround herself with people that are loyal to her above mm-hmm. all and are just going to do whatever she says. Um, we've seen how this plays out 
for people and it never goes well, <laughs> you know, like all across yeah. that's why we have such a problem with sexual violence, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A bunch of yes people. It is the same exact pattern and it's it is a hard wall to hit when you hit the end of the line with that um kind of like social support. Uh, and it does suck to be the replacement people, like, any which way you cut it, I, it's such a high and such a low, um, but, uh, yeah, thank you all for your time and hanging out with me and talking about this stuff, it helps my heart to tell the truth about it with you, you know? Absolutely. I'm so glad um, we did this. I appreciate this. you holding space for this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, me too. Yeah. Kaylee Higgins is a writer, activist, former professional dancer, and publicist for artists, brands, events, and music festivals. In 2020, she started an Instagram account that exposed multiple serial predators in the music industry. In 2021, she helped organize hunger strikes at the Louisiana State Penitentiary and David Wade Correctional Center that successfully demanded the release of 23 prisoners from illegal long-term solitary confinement. It should be noted that the Instagram project that Kaylee ran in 2020 is what inspired Alexa Nicholas to post publicly about her court cases involving her abusive ex-husband, Mike Maloche from the band Rue. You can find more information on Kaylee Higgins and her work at KayleeHiggins.com. Kay Brown is the steward, leader, and founder of Four for Consent. Kay is a living legacy of commitment to serving survivors of violence and therefore stays at the forefront of the highest levels of professional education related to advancing the fields that support that work. Kay has been in advocacy for nearly a decade. Their certifications include being a nationally credentialed victim advocate, holding a master's in criminology and criminal justice with a concentration in victimology. Kay is a nationally recognized advocate specializing in sexual assault, human trafficking, child abuse, and domestic violence intervention, campus advocacy, comprehensive victim intervention, and program management. Kay was awarded registered advocate with advanced standing status from the Ohio Advocate Network and has also achieved the requirements to be recognized by California's OES as a sexual assault and domestic violence counselor. Kay is a member of the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, Campus Advocacy and Prevention Professionals Association, and GLAAD. Kay works to create a safer and more positive culture in nightlife where all people are free to be themselves without experiencing discrimination or violence. For more info on Kay's organization and what sets them apart from the rest, check out their FAQ section towards the bottom of their website on fourforconsent.org. That's F-O-U-R, the number four, C-O-N-S-E-N-T dot org. Now, bless your whole entire soul for listening to all of this. A couple of things from the episode that we forgot to mention or finish talking about. There are resources for survivors and the people who love us linked in the episode description. Resources change sometimes, so we'll keep the links updated as needed. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to need to go to the website goodmorningmayberry.com in order to get those updates because YouTube does not update uh, anything that we do on our back end. Number two, a common opinion amongst people who have tried to work with Alexa. One takeaway that we all seem to share is that um, we feel she'd be a stronger collaborator on collective endeavors if she had at least a little bit of experience uh, working in administration or organizing anything, uh, at least for a couple of months. Um, Thank you again to Music Industry, Watchdog, 4 for Consent, and Nightlife Safety Summit. Go show them some love at 4forconsent.org, nightlifesafetysummit.com, and kayleehiggins.com. Thank you to my guests, Kaylee and Kay. Plug in with them and their unprecedentedly impactful projects by clicking on the links in the episode descriptions, kayleehiggins.com, and again, find Kay at 4forconsent.org and Nightlife Safety Summit. Yo, and for real, thank you. You, yeah, you, I'm talking to you, you, right there, for listening, thank you. Listening is such a big deal, especially if you've already heard of and support ePredators or Alexa, I especially appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time, but I know it's hard for people to hear us talking about this stuff when they have already fallen in love with the idea of what they thought that it could be. Please share this episode with anyone that you think needs to hear it. 
Before we go, I want to be clear that we purposefully ask all legally incorporated nonprofit organizations like PAVE, globally renowned publications like Rolling Stone Magazine, and influential broadcasts like RealPod with Victoria Brown and Vulnerable with Christy Romano to redact, revise, and remove any and all misleading and false claims that fabricate and omit facts, causing permeating widespread harm to survivors, advocates, and our loved ones. We also purposefully call upon Alexa and her husband to cancel the bad faith trademark that they filed for on November 21st, 2022, and to refund all donations that they've received into their personal control in the name of an organization that Alexa overthrew months ago and replaced the leadership with unquestioning devout followers that she found on the internet. We also call upon Alexa and her husband, Michael, to correct the damage that they've done by telling defamatory and misleading lies about what's happened with Eat Predators and all of us. I ask supporters of Eat Predators, as well as Alexa's fans and devouts, to be realistic and fair about their analysis of Alexa's claims and our histories of working with her. Help us help her to stop abusing her power and undermining the positive impact she claims to want to have. If you share our common goal of stopping predators from dominating events using super basic manipulation, then you are already on our side. I'm available for public and private discussions about any and all of this. We will continue to update you as the situation plays on. Thank you for your attention and influence. You can reach out to the podcast at connect at goodmorningmayberry.com, call the studio at 415-3434-420, or hunt us down on social media if you want to talk to us or need us. I can't promise to respond immediately, but I can promise that Kaylee Kay and myself are committed to building systems that support people, and we will collaborate on responses regarding e-predators, specifically when it comes to survivor requests and resources. You can join the Good Morning Mayberry community on coffee, ko-fi.com slash goodmorningmayberry, where you can make a one-time donation as many times as you like to us, Uh, and we also have a monthly subscription as low as $4 a month. And you can support the show and our guests while getting extra stuff from us. You can also just tip me, your host, uh, Shift Orion. My handle is I am Shift on Cash App and Venmo. This episode of Good Morning Mayberry is sponsored in part by Four for Consent and Nightlife Safety Summit. One last time, thank you to Kay and Kaylee for chatting with me to get the truth out there for you all to hear. And thank you to you, again, for listening. And even... Thanks to Alexa for contributing to the circumstances that offer me an opportunity to show up and do my best to make the world a better, safer, and more reasonable place to share with everyone. Now, always remember to never forget. And I mean, I think people have the ability to do better, but like they have to want to. And part of that is like being honest about like what really happened, because like if you're not owning the harm that you caused and you're not... Or if you're owning it, but only to, like, make it go away. Like, that's not what accountability is. Right. And I think people in positions of privilege can more easily just kind of put out fires and then replace Mm. whoever it is that they upset with somebody else. You know, like they could just kind of put out that fire and move on to the next thing. They don't have to stay and deal with their the the consequences of their behavior as much and um i just wonder if you know this is kind of a result of like a a lack of experience like her not not really learning that lesson yet (laughs) um and that uh you know maybe she thinks that there will people will just kind of continue to replace everybody and so she, she won't have to ever really deal with um all these people that now feel burned Uh. if she's going to continue prioritizing loyalty oh you know it's like she just wants to surround herself with people that are loyal to her above Mm -hmm. all and are just going to do whatever she says um we've seen how this plays out for people and it never goes well you know like Mm -hmm. that's why we have such a problem with sexual violence right Mm -hmm. yeah it is the same exact pattern and it's it is a hard wall to hit when you hit the end of the line with that social support and it does suck to be the replacement people it's such a high and such a low good morning mayberry is brought to you by a mass studio